So just a few thoughts while we, um, uh, to, to bring things together a little bit. Um, one of the things that really I, I would ask, you, I'd like to ask you about, or that if we, if we were in class together, I, I'd want to discuss is the role that objects, material things play in the Rape of the Lock. The Rape of the Lock is filled with luxuries, with commodities, with consumer goods. It features tea. It features, um, you know, coffee, tobacco, playing cards, um, all, many different types of fabrics, um, imported goods, screens from India, um, all these things that speak to England's increasing importance and wealth um, and its central position in an emerging global trade empire. And this is par and part of what um, the, sat the satire is about is about the emergence of a class of people uh, who are conspicuous consumers, essentially. The only reason th that um, Belinda and Lord Peter and all these other people have to live, they don't go to Hampton Court. They're not statesmen, statespeople, at the time statesmen. They're not um, you know, cert uh, people who are running the country. They hang out at the palace basically just to be beautiful people, to socialize, to be all like entourage right? Um, and so that, that's part of the nature of the satire. And, it, and it, all together, I guess, you know, just to sort of reach back and think about the sweep of time that we've covered in this class between Beowulf and the Rape of the Lock, um, between this early epic, which also plays with juxtapositions, which also has a kind of um, uneasy tension between the moralizing of the narrator and the glorification of the people that it describes. But the material culture is so vastly different, right? From the, the simple mead halls and the swords and the gold rings and the torques and the, and the mead of Anglo-Saxon England um, and, and this early Danish Germanic culture to the, the incredible sumptuousness and the hair and the clothing and the dress and the tea and all the, the consumer goods of um, Alexander Pope's Rape of the Lock is, and we've moved so far. And um, I, I guess I, I, one of the things that I want to ask is, what is literature for, right? It has what literature is for changed from the, um, the, the poetry of performance that Be the Beowulf poet undertakes to the, the, the print culture that Pope is writing for, the, the, the middle-class people who, who, who devoured this book, made it a bestseller for this, this beautifully wrought um, and uh, gentle but satiric um, inquiry into the lives of the rich and the famous. And I'm just going to make just a short little, um, take a few minutes to make a short digression to talk about an interesting theory that I learned a few years back. Um, by a guy named, um, hold on a second here, a guy with the hilarious name of Daniel Lord Smale. I don't know where he is now, but at the time he was working at, uh, um, in the history department at Harvard. And he was originally a um, medieval historian, but took this interesting turn into thinking about um, neuro neuroscience and neurochemistry in combination with the idea of deep history. That is the idea of looking at uh, you know, human history for the long haul. We're talking like from development of fire from from the Paleolithic period all the way through the Neolithic through you know the the, the old and new stone age and the beginning of agriculture and seeing basically um, really considering the fact that the period of um, human history in which there is recorded history in which there is writing is a tiny little fraction just a tiny little fraction of the long long uh, duration of actual human history. And um, he writes this interesting book called On Deep History and the Brain. It's not too long and not too dense to me. Um, maybe it'll be a, a reach for some of you. Some of you might find it interesting. But one of the things that he talks about is literature as a mood-altering mechanism. And he basically views culture and society as um, ways that people alter them, their own or their, their other moods. And he sees traditional older cultures from before the 18th century as largely being built around um, altering other people's moods. And he makes a distinction between what he calls teletropic and autotropic mood-altering mechanisms. 
And teletropic mechanisms alter the, the mood of others. And some of these are built into our biology at a very deep level. Um, a baby crying, for example, will affect your mood. It'll affect you. It will, might give you concern. It might make you annoyed. Um, if you've had a kid and they're no longer babies, it might have no effect on you, on you at all because you hear it and you think, oh, that's somebody else's baby. But in, in most of the time, a baby cries in order to affect other people. And so much of what, of what we do affects other people. The, um, the Viking warlord who threatens another, another warrior with a sword. Um, the whole spec, the, the massive and numerous spectacles of public executions or sacrifices that, that filled, um, human culture before modernity. Um, religious ceremonies, the intoning of a mask by a priest, all these have an effect on other people to, to calm you or to fear you or to make you happy or to console you. And, um, in, in, uh, cultures with more simple, mat material civilizations, um, argues, uh, smell, um, teletropic, um, mechanisms for mood altering that affecting other people was, um, the primary way that societies organize themselves. Um, with the rise of a global, um, consumer trade good, and particularly with the rise of, um, he sees of neuro affecting chemicals in the 18th century, but other things too, there comes to be, um, a reorientation of civilization around autotropic mood altering mechanisms, the way that we alter our own moods rather and, and neurochemistry rather than others. And he sees this as having to do with the um, introduction in the 18th century on a large scale of coffee, of sugar, um, uh, which is certainly, I mean, can't deny that it's mood, that it affects your brain chemistry, it gives you a boost, it gives you a push. Um, uh, but, but also, interestingly enough, literature, novels, I mean, Think about how uh, the, the whole idea of reading for pleasure, the way that you consume, uh, um, you know, not not necessarily the stuff that you find in here, but the, like the kind of books that an, uh, you know, as just as an avid reader, you you enjoy at bedtime, the kind of book you can't put down, and the the kind of brain state that that puts you in of of being outside yourself, of being both calmed and stimulated at the same time. Um, erotic, erotics. I meant to write erotica. Um, this is the age that where we first see erotica as a consumer good in the 18th century. Uh, books like um, uh, uh, Fanny Hill, um, and, there, and there was a whole moral panic in the 18th century about young women reading novels at all. Um, but but shopping, the very act of shopping, the very act of consuming, gives you a dopamine rush or anything like this. And so um, we're at the end of, um, we're, we're at a period, according to Smale, when we get to the 18th century, we're really at this turning point, this transition towards modernity, where um, uh, literature becomes a consumer good. It becomes um, not a kind of way of, of organizing society or, or a way of, um, you know, affecting others. I wrote this sonnet for you um, as as, an, as a courtier or something like that. We're putting on this play in order to induce the state in other people, but the, the a reorientation towards the reader who buys and consumes the literature in order to to feel or to achieve a certain state, um, whether that be sadness or sympathy or happy or, or just escape, right? Um, all of this is coming to pass in the emergent literary culture of the 18th century, of which we are only sadly scratching the surface. I'm a medievalist, and I know more about the early modern period um, than I do about this 17th and 18th century stuff, so I've weighted this course more heavily towards the stuff um, with, in which I have expertise. That seems to be an appropriate thing to do um, for the benefit of you as my students. Um, but there's so much going on in the beginning in the 18th century that I, I would encourage you to... to explore it yourself um, and to explore the 18th century's own encounter with these um, forces that are transforming it, the forces of consumption, the forces of pleasure that are um, changing people's relationship to reality. Um, in this period, this period which is sometimes called the enlighten Enlightenment, where at, at the time they imagined that they were overthrowing the ancient 
uh, superstitions and customs that had enslaved humankind since the beginning and that they were going to put everything on the basis of reason and rational in inquiry and, and liberate humankind to a new era. This, of course, culminates in the, in the French, in the American and the French revolutions. But at the same time, looking at this through the perspective of Daniel Ward Smale, we have to ask, did we overthrow kings only to make ourselves subject to our brain chemistry, to make ourselves subject to pleasure.